Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision, and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today comes from a distinguished business family, a third generation, Mr. Arun Bharatram, the grandson of Lala Sriram. A distinguished business person in his own right, he is today the president of the Confederation of Indian Industry, a man of many parts, a player of the sitar, with a deep and profound commitment to working in the fields of the arts and education. Welcome, Mr. Bhattar. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, as president of CAI, you said that sort of one of the themes of the first year was that it was going to look at old economies, new economies, merging together. And in a sense, that is the, the sort of both the dichotomy and the strength of India, sort of the merging the old and the new. And you represent that in your own very distinguished a lineage. Uh, in what ways do you see the new India, the new economy in a sense, uh, responding to, adapting to, being influenced by the old? Well, uh, let me put it like this. Um, the new economy which is represented by the very well-known IT industry today, but it goes beyond that, the new economy, the, the knowledge-based industries example, the uh, uh, biotechnology sector, uh, pharmaceutical sector, uh, research and development sector. These are all part of what we now term as the uh, knowledge-based industries and enterprises. Now, these are, in a sense, the new uh, vision of India because we have some tremendous strengths industries. The reason why we uh, this year had our theme called the new economy and the old economy moving ahead together was because we felt that the old economy has to use the techniques, the uh, available, the new uh, uh, knowledge that comes from the, the uh, new economy, use that for transforming the old economy into more competitive and, uh, enterprises. And at the same time, the new economy has to work with the old economy to have a space to operate in. I also meant in the sense that uh, uh, the new um, you know, management styles of the, the economy, the business and the firms, uh, and, and in what ways they might derive or learn from uh, the old, or is, it, or is it sort of an unequivocal jettisoning of the old? No, I think it is a continuum and it is a continuous learning from the past. For example, the uh, Japanese uh, call this uh, continuous improvement as Kaizen, which is uh, literally which means continuous improvement. So whether it is in the management techniques, whether it is in management philosophy, whether it is in manufacturing uh, techniques or philosophy, there, is to, there has to be always a continuous improvement. And one therefore learns from the past. Also meant in the sense that you know you have um, say the Harvard Business School model, yeah. and I think that uh, you, know, you come from a business family. Um, you did engineering abroad, but uh, you know your children have studied management abroad. Uh, in, in, in in what ways do you find that that model adapts to India? In, in what ways is it Indianized? No, I think uh, there has to be a model for each country, and uh, whereas we learn from the Harvard Business School or from other business schools in, uh, in uh, the United States and England and uh, other parts of the world. But I think our own management institutions, whether they are the IIMs or now uh, uh, there are many independent institutions of management that have come up across the country, they all have been evolving and learning from techniques that have been available from the United States, from Harvard Business School, from Stanford and uh, their own research which has been very effective. And the research is basically towards what are the conditions under which Indian industry works, uh, what are the very special uh, nuances of Indian industry, and uh, how do we uh, train our young minds to work in this environment. In what ways uh, are your management styles in your business is different from your father's? Oh, I think uh, every generation uh, there is a change, uh, not because it is a truism, but I think because uh, uh, the 
whole culture starts evolving. Uh, we are much more integrated with the rest of the world today than in my father's time. So I think there is a, a, a difference in the way that uh, my father's generation managed businesses and the way that uh, I would manage my businesses today. And I'm sure that uh, when the next generation comes around, whether they're my sons or professionals or whoever run the companies in the next generation, uh, they would have learned something different and uh, they would apply something different to uh, the conditions which prevail at that point of time. Uh, specifically, I think uh, uh, between the last generation and in my generation, uh, there has been a lot more of delegation to professionals uh, in terms of running businesses. Uh, I think uh, we've learned a lot more of uh, quantitative analysis of uh, how we analyze our uh, businesses, how they are run, uh, what uh, uh, are the kind of control systems that we require today. So these have again changed over the uh, generation and I'm sure they will again change uh, with the next generation. Um, you know, the CII that you had um, you know, really started off as being a conglomerate of uh, largely engineering companies and now represents a much broader base uh, of industry uh, and has also seemed to evolve from being purely uh, a body lobbying for its own interests uh, into at least an apparent social commitment. Uh, how serious and substantial is the uh, social commitment of, of big business? Uh, you know, obviously there is a fair amount of cynicism from people outside business and say, well, you know, there has, to be, there has to be a cost-benefit to this. Yes. Um, so how serious is this? Uh, I can share with you that a large number of our members uh, on their own have started activities in rural areas, uh, whether it is for uh, education, primary education, whether it is for uh, water management, uh, giving know-how and creating self-help groups in villages where they can uh, create, make check dams, make uh, watershed management as a way of life and increase their livelihood and income through that. This, is, you know, this assumes uh, special significance because uh, the CII is a votary for privatization, right. looking for the government's retreat from right. uh, most sectors right. really. Right. Uh, and, and, and I think the model in, in the United States and in many of the sort of uh, developed countries in inverted commas uh, has been a very proactive role uh, by industry in, in, in the social sectors, right. uh, in education, in, in philanthropy, in, in giving. Yes. Um, and I think the Indian experience has been, uh, or the perception certainly is, that there is very little giving in that sense uh, from the Indian corporate sector. Uh, most of what we see in Indian philanthropy really tends to be around religious organizations uh, and institutions. We don't really have the, the, you know, the, the concept of, of, of foundations uh, funded by Indian money, Indian business money in that sense. Uh, I, I know that your own uh, family and your own group have done uh, substantial amounts of work, certainly in Delhi in educational institutions, cultural institutions, but as a phenomena for industry, what steps? Do you see this substantially evolving? Well, um, let me go back a little bit in history uh, when uh, the um, tax rates in the country were extremely high. They went up to almost levels of 98%. Uh, and uh, there was no room for people to accumulate wealth to do social service, social work, whether it was in the field of education or any other field. Uh, but in spite of that, there are many, many silent performers in terms of families who have done a lot of work across the country. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there is, as one goes from one generation to another, there is far greater commitment from individuals who wish to do something for the less fortunate people in our country. And it's not only in religious activity, it is, I think, now spreading to, as I said, into the uh, rural areas where we feel the most need. It's not so much in the urban areas because in the urban areas, I think we tend to look after ourselves much better. But in rural areas where there is need for education, there is need for drinking water, there is need for uh, uh, other social infrastructure being created. And I think a lot of industry very quietly and, and in its own way is doing a lot of work. And 
this is in support of the government. Obviously, we can't take the place of government. There is this sort of, uh, sort of theoretical, intellectual, and, 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 and practical debate, if I may put it that way, uh, on this issue of, uh, of privatization. Uh, how far is enough, and, and, and uh, how far should privatization go, and in, in what areas? Um, you have been a very strong votary of privatization. You have held that the government should get out of Maruti Adyog. It's not worth the government being in there. Uh, it, it's not just a question of the government staying in, 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 in non-profitable public sector enterprises. CII has set up a special task force uh, in this issue. Right. What is your model uh, for privatization? How far is, is good enough? Well, I think uh, privatization has to be uh, in the context of the development of a country. Uh, uh, in the political development as well as in the context of uh, the social development of the country. Now, I feel that um, the time has come when we should seriously start uh, privatizing, f first of all, in the context of the government getting out of interfering with the management of public sector companies. This they have been loath in doing, uh, the bureaucracy, the political system, has just not given freedom to the public sector units to work uh, without the encumbrances of the administrative ministries. Uh, this should have been done years and years ago. Uh, I think we have seen that there are excellent managers in the public sector companies, but they just are uh, so uh, burdened with uh, controls that they are not able to perform. At the same time, I feel that um, in today's context, the government should really not be running businesses. It just does not know how to run businesses. And therefore, it is bringing down the value of the uh, assets that it has. Any public sector company, if it was run by uh, uh, independent private managers, would do much better than what the government is able to do. Uh, you take hotels, you take uh, force. Uh, modern bread is now uh, has been privatized, but you take any sector uh, where the government is running a business, and, uh, and you th if it's not a monopoly, uh, because of course the government also runs many monopolies, and of course does well in, mon in a monopoly situation, because there are no, there's no competition. So you are drawing a distinction between ownership and management. Well, what I'm saying is that the ownership situation is going to change as the uh, political uh, will, let us say, of the people changes. And, uh, but as far as the management of the companies is concerned, that should have been, if I use the word privatized a long time ago. But at this juncture, I feel the government must get out of managing companies and, uh, and in some cases uh, selling out its uh, shareholders. In this model of privatization, how far would you go? Uh, you know, you have models in, 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 in other developing countries where public transportation, water supply, health, uh, have been privatized, uh, and yet you have this sort of whole uh, intellectual uh, uh, trust tradition uh, in petters from people like Amartya Sen, which sort of hold that it's still very important uh, for the government to stay in, 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 in certain areas. Uh, you have been very uh, active in the areas of education, uh, the government's role in education. Uh, where Where is the balance for you? Well, I think uh, at this point of time in our uh, in our country, I think uh, the government, uh, I don't think, can get out of uh, managing uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, the urban development and the, and the water systems and things like that. I don't think that would be acceptable to the public, and I don't think it's important enough for it to be done today. Uh, Britain has done it, and very successfully, but I don't think that would suit us at this point of time. But uh, when it comes to running schools and colleges and things like that. I think as far as compulsory primary education is concerned, that is the responsibility of the government. But along with that, the government should also encourage private uh, schools to exist and grow and, and flourish. And as far as uh, higher education is concerned, I think there should be a mixed model. There should be some government institutions in some, in some special areas, and there should also be a, a freedom for uh, private sector to be in the higher education field. That model has worked uh, extremely well in the United States. You have state colleges and you have private colleges. Uh, 
both coexist and have done extremely well. You've also had the CIA has, has held forth uh, quite eloquently and sometimes were very pointedly at the interface between politics and business. And, and uh, statements have been made, I think, sort of quite, uh, uh, shall I say, in, in a very uh, dismissive, sharp manner, certainly by your predecessor, uh, about this, uh, this, this issue. Um, what has been your relationship uh, with, with the politics and the politicians? Well, I believe that uh, it is our responsibility as, as uh, citizens of the country where we have a strong view, just like anybody else, to hold opinion. And we very strongly believe that the politicians have held a view for the last 50 years which has not got the country out of the uh, economic, uh, if I may use the word, mess that we have been in. We've seen other countries uh, who have done substantially better than us. Um, Korea was at the same level of development as we were in the 60s. Uh, they have an income level which is 100-fold more than ours. Uh, there are countries uh, like uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, who have done extremely well, barring the last two or three years. But I think that's just a blip for, uh, for a short period of time, and they'll again get back onto a very high growth rate. So I think uh, it is right for us to be talking to the politicians that what has not worked in the last 20 years needs to be changed, and we need to work with a different model, which has worked in other countries. I think there's also been this discourse uh, within the CII and between the CII and politics and politicians uh, about the role of money, of financial contributions uh, from business, by business, to political parties uh, in exchange for, uh, you know, you mentioned the aspect of lobbying. I think lobbying is one thing, right. but to be able to sort of uh, have a quid pro quo influence. In, influence in terms of, uh, you know, relationship between contributions and decision making, mm -hmm. uh, as certainly has been the perception in the past. Uh, is the CIA working on, on some kind of, of, of code or, or, or uh, formalizing this? Well, you see, we can only advise and guide our members as to what they should do. And we have been saying that political donations should be made above board by check. Uh, and uh, it should be done because you have a belief that a certain party will do something good for the country. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think it is possible for us to issue any kind of uh, uh, diktats to our members uh, as to how they should fund or, or whether they should fund political parties or not. But as, uh, as happens in a, anywhere else in the world, I think political donations are a way of life, but they should be given not for seeking favors and, and uh, influencing. Decisions. You have been a, a, a student of Pandit uh, Ravi Shankar. You've had a, a deep interest uh, in the arts. Uh, there is also a, a popular perception that with uh, liberalization, with globalization, that there is perhaps a sort of a coarsening of the sensibilities, uh, that we are becoming more uh, mercenary in our approach. Uh, and, and you have done a great deal in your own sort of work and the institutions you have created uh, towards the refining of the sensibility through the arts. Right. Uh, do you fear the impact of this aspect of the globalization of culture? Well, if you're talking about the globalization of culture and what impact it will have on our arts and on our, our sensibilities, sensibilities. And our perception that there's a coarsening of it in some senses. We well, I think, um, again, I'll talk as a citizen here not as a businessman, but as a citizen of this country, that I do see that there are two streams of what is happening. One, we are seeing that uh, with this uh, internationalization, with the internet, with television, which is beamed across the world, uh, that there is some kind of a common culture evolving. Uh, one may call it the Western culture, and one may call it the influenced culture. Uh, Personally, I'm not all that excited about it or happy about it. Uh, maybe I'm old 
old fashioned way. Maybe I'm uh, uh, from a last from the last generation. My children don't believe so. Uh, but uh, I think there's another revolution taking place in this country, and that is that um, the younger people are also going back to our own roots. Uh, are much more interested in uh, our arts, our music, our uh, dance. And so you're seeing, therefore, these two distinct streams emerging. And I, I believe, ultimately, that uh, we will see this amalgam of uh, both our own culture reviving and, uh, and also uh, imbib imbibing and absorbing something from uh, the rest of the world. So in, 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 in what ways is, 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 is this aspect of exposure of the experience of Indian, the traditional Indian cultures and the forms, uh, your own sort of you know, several decades of playing the sitar, what does it do to you? What does it do to a human being? Why is it important? Why must we work uh, to, to preserving this? And why, is your, why are you supporting this you know, what, as, as, as an ideal to what end? Well, uh, I think... Um, our culture, whether it is music, whether it is sculpture, whether it is dance, goes back thousands of years, and it has been refined and quantified over the years. Uh, and today, it uh, represents one of the old uh, cultures which exist in, in today's modern world. So you have the Greek culture, you have the uh, Egyptian culture, you have the uh, Western culture. And we have the, the Chinese culture, and we have uh, a very strong Indian culture. Uh, I feel that uh, it has stood the uh, test of time. Uh, it has continuously changed, modified. And uh, personally, for me, it has been playing the sitar for uh, almost five decades, has been something which has given me immense tranquility, pleasure, pleasure for myself and when I used to perform in public, hopefully for the others too. Um, and uh, so I think it's been, it, our culture is, is so valuable that I don't think that we should ever think of losing it or ever let it get lost. You're uh, you know, 59 years old, you've had sort of many successful uh, uh, cycles in, in career as a business person, you had India's, uh, uh, well, one of India's preeminent confederations, though, I will, uh, uh, what, what goals do you set for yourself in the next cycles of your life? Well, um, you know, one of the things that I have um, been internally thinking is that um, the uh, times for businessmen are changing very, very rapidly. We have to now adapt to uh, a very competitive environment. Uh, there is global competition, there is internal competition, and I think we need young people to run our enterprises today who are much more in tune with what is going to happen today and what is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I think as far as business is concerned, I'm my goal is to create an organization mm -hmm. where the next generation is going to be running it. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily my own sons, mm -hmm. but professional mm -hmm. people who are going to be running it. Uh, because ultimately, in, in today's world, mm -hmm. we have to look after the interests of all shareholders. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, the best people should be running, mm -hmm. uh, running enterprises. So I'm looking at myself in the next few years, building this organization, mm -hmm. this company into one Mm -hmm. which is uh, going to be run and managed by people who are in tune with what is happening, are excellent managers who understand the human nature mm -hmm. uh, and, and provide motivation mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. their employees mm -hmm. and the next mm -hmm. generation. Thank you very much.